course, this live stream is for YouTube, in, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. Alrighty, looks like we are live. Okay. So it looks like we are good to go. And I'm going to hit record here for this particular Zoom session. I'm going to stop sharing the music here. Sorry for anybody who's a fan of order. And I believe, yeah, that's it. Welcome, everyone. Tonight's session of Conchas y Café, the bilingual community writing workshop series, is going to be more of an introductory session. I'll be going over some techniques and things to consider as we start our 15-week series of workshops. Y para ustedes que prefieren uh, que la presentación sea en español, aquí voy a también empezar a traducir un poco a... Uh, Como es una clase bilingüe, vamos a estar intercambiando entre el inglés y el español. Uh, si por alguna razón necesitan un poco de um, pausa o tienen alguna pregunta, por favor, uh, siéntanse um, bienvenidos a, a preguntar. You can always use the chat for those of you on Zoom, or you can unmute or raise your hand, however works for you, uh, as long as you are not disruptive to others. For anyone following on the live streams, you can use the chats in whichever stream you are watching. Um, for those of you watching on Instagram Live, I am trying to keep track of that as much as possible. For everyone else watching on either YouTube, uh, Twitter, formerly known as Twitter, um, Facebook, you can use your uh, you know device or whatever, and I will be able to see your questions in the chat there as well. So to get us going, like I said, for those who joined in on Zoom, I did upload our handout for tonight, um, but we're going to be projecting that on the screen as well. So that way you can follow along. Y para empezar, aquí tengo una cita que como es típico de nosotros, nos gusta empezar cada sesión con una cita. Esta cita viene de Michael Haneke. Uh, Michael Haneke es un director y guionista del cine. Um, viene de Austria y además es una persona que típicamente examina temas sociales y los sentidos de alejamiento que se viven a uh, los las personas en la so sociedad moderna. Michael Haneke is quoted as saying, and this comes from a uh, interview in Medium. Uh, I believe it's a website, Medium. Uh, he is quoted as saying, look, life itself is the object of art. What does this say to you? Mira, la vida misma es el objeto del arte. ¿Cómo les parece esta cita de Michael Haneke? And feel free to jump in. There's no need to hold back any initial reactions to this particular quote Nettie wrote in the chat life can be unappreciated if we don't look closer yeah I like that Life can be unappreciated. I think that that's a uh, very interesting way of of interpreting the quote because you know we can take a lot of different things for for granted, um, but life in in itself is one of those things that uh, you know it, it can be <laughs> definitely uh, lost on us as we're living it. Uh, Mojda added in the chat. Uh, it popped up. There we go. Uh, Mojde added, life and art are both about creativity. And Julie adds, life is art. 
And Erica wrote, also, the good and the bad in our lives is simply art. <laughs> I like that. That kind of uh, paints a pretty picture of, of all the bad things that happen to us. My dad has a, a phrase that he particularly likes to say, cuando nos toca, nos toca. But I think that this is a, a much better way of of uh, <laughs> appreciating the, the bad in life. Anyone else? There's no right or wrong answer, by the way. It's all about your interpretation. What do you think, Abraham? My uh, partner in crime. Oh, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, for this one, I think uh, you you have to live and have experiences in order for you to actually represent them or depict them in certain ways of art. So you have to experience things mm -hmm. and then filter them, but you have to be alive, I guess, to get that across. Mm -hmm. And then people will connect because they themselves yeah, I think there's definitely something to the idea that we have to have lived experiences in order to be able to uh, turn them into a form of art, right? How about you, Angie? Our other partner in crime, what do you think? Um, I think that this quote, look at life, it's another one. Um, I kind of feel like it's kind of, it just... Yeah, no, I, I can agree with the quote with that life being life is a piece of art itself in a way. Um, like every day we have to go through a process of living each day and it's not until the very end of like an era for us or an, an, the end of a life for us that we won't even see the bigger picture until like we're completed the process and that's how most art is. And, you know, at the end of it, it's, you know, it's a masterpiece, don't get me wrong, but it's what the pro it's the process that makes it worth everything, makes it such a beautiful, like, masterpiece. Mm. My, that's just my point. I like that. Yeah, I think that that's also a, a really good way to look at it. Um, you know, it's, uh, life can be kind of difficult at times, and at times it can be really joyous, right? But the process of it, you know, living it, you know, is something that we can appreciate as as it as it comes, and then maybe with a, with hindsight, there's there's a beauty to it in the way that we find beauty in art. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate I appreciate your your two cents, Angie. Thank you for adding that. Mojde yeah. in the chat, uh, Mojde in the chat also wrote, "Art itself is the object of life, especially in dark and difficult times." Um, I think I might interpret what Mojda says as like art is maybe the thing that can bring light to a particularly difficult period, which I definitely can agree with that. I've had that, that experience myself and roots added every experience in life is a feeling, a sight or a smell to move us or inspire us. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of things that happen to us in our daily lives, um, and even, you know, larger events that maybe live on in our memory that can inspire works of art. Uh, and Erica wrote, or you can fuel your art through life experiences. Yeah, I think that that's, that's particularly important for, for us as artists is to, you know, understand that, that there is a fuel to observation, right, and living life, um, which is why things like reading and uh, traveling, experiencing new and different things uh, periodically, you know, those things do help us as as we craft new works of art. Does anyone have any other comments or maybe other things that this might have inspired? ¿Qué más piensan ustedes? Nada. All right. Well, in that case, let's continue on. So again, this is uh, 
what I would call an introductory session, right? We're going to sort of give you a little bit of our idea of what, what the purpose of this particular 15-week series is. And one of the things when we were discussing this theme of through the lens, you know, we were talking about how we can integrate photography into creative writing and vice versa, how, how creative writing can maybe even influence photography. And it's a way for us to really examine this core concept of ekphrasis. Para ustedes que han estado con nosotros ya por muchos años, han escuchado este, este término ya varias veces. Ekphrasis is not new to Conchas y Café. We have done series in the past where we explored this, this particular uh, concept. Uh, but for anybody who isn't familiar, ekphrasis, spelled either with a K or with a C, as you see here on the screen, comes from the Greek for the description of a work of art produced as a rhetorical exercise. It is a vivid, often dramatic verbal description of a visual work of art, either real or imagined. Uh, and that also, keep in mind, is kind of the original definition of it. In ancient times, it referred to a description of anything, person, or experience. So this could be really like an interpretation of anything that you might live, any part of life, ultimately, kind of going back to our to our quote, right? The word comes from the Greek ek and phrasis, meaning out and speak, respectively, and the verb ekphrasin, to proclaim or call an inanimate object by name. So here in this particular case, you know, it's talking about uh, speaking to something that exists in a physical form, an inanimate object. In other words, a work of art. According to the Poetry Foundation, an ekphrastic poem is a vivid description of a scene or, more commonly, a work of art. More generally, an ekphrastic poem is a poem inspired or stimulated by a work of art. Y aquí para traducírselo, ekphrasis del griego para la descripción de una obra de arte producida como ejercicio retórico es una descripción verbal vívida, a menudo dramático, de una obra de arte visual, sea real o imaginado. Uh, y como dije, esto es como una definición que, que viene de, de los tiempos pasados. No es tanto la definición moderna. En la antigüedad se refería a la descripción de una cosa, persona o experiencia. La palabra viene del griego ek y frasis, uh, significando fuera y hablar, respectivamente. Y el verbo ekphrasin, el proclamar o llamar por nombre a un objeto inanimado. Según la Fundación de Poesía, un poema ekfrástico es una descripción vívida de una escena o, más comúnmente, una obra de arte. En general, un poema ekfrástico, perdón, hay un typo, un poema ekfrástico es un poema inspirado o estimulado por una obra de arte. Man, two typos on this one. I apologize. So, are there any questions about what an ekphrastic work of art is or an ekphrastic poem? Is it relatively clear? No questions. Wow. You guys are on top of it then. Of course, several of you have been here before, so I'm not surprised. To give us a sense of what an ekphrastic work of art is, we have here a poem from the Book of Questions, El Libro de las Preguntas por Pablo Neruda. And uh, the English version is translated by William O'Daly. Uh, so I do not take credit for this one in particular. Um, but this, this poem is a poem that was part of Pablo Neruda's final uh, works published. This is actually the last book that I'm aware of that, that he published, El Libro de las Preguntas. 
The Book of Questions is literally a book of questions. It's a collection of poems that are nothing but poetic questions asked in a poetic form. And um, so, you know, we'll read this and then I will show you an ekphrastic poem that was developed in response to this. Uh, I do see a question in the chat, though, here from Nettie. When it comes to referencing other creators' work of art in a poem, what's the right thing to do? Um, or right, what's the right way to do it? When it comes to referencing another person's work, there's a couple of different ways that you can go about it. You can either do uh, something like a footnote or, you know, where you add like a little asterisk and then at the bottom of the page, you have, you know, referencing or including lines of text from, and then you give the, the citation. If it's something that is, uh, as you'll see uh, later when, you know, talking about ekphrastic poetry, if it's something that is inspired by, but does not specifically uh, incorporate work from another person, then you can either uh, say something like um, for Pablo Neruda in this case, or you can say um, after Pablo Neruda. Like there's there's different ways that you can phrase a little little uh, kind of like a what's it called an epigraph at the beginning of the of the poem or of the work of art, whatever it might be, uh, to just let people know this is inspired by another person. But good question, Eddie. Of course, if you are doing direct quotations from someone, you definitely have to cite them uh, out of respect for the artist, of course. Do I have any volunteers? Hay alguien por ahí que guste leer cualquiera de los poemas, ya sea en inglés o en español. No volunteers. I can read the Spanish one. All right. Thank you, San Juanita. A mí me gusta el español por eso. <laughs> well, I like Spanish. Pues entrele. <laughs> Never you're ready. So I read the Spanish first? Yeah, you can read the oh, Spanish first. Okay, okay. And it ends right there, sir, or, or above? It's lower. Is That's that... it. It's all. Oh, not bad. Okay. All That's right. good. Yeah. Okay. ¿Por qué los inmensos aviones no se pasean con sus hijos? ¿Cuál es el pájaro amarillo que llena el nido de limones? ¿Por qué no se enseñan a sacar miel del sol a los helicópteros? ¿Dónde, dónde dejó la luna llena su saco nocturno de harina? That's it. That's it. That is it. Okay. Thank you, San Juanita. Sure. And I also had a hand raise from Roots. Roots, would you mind reading for us the English version? Yes. The Book of Questions by Pablo Neruda. Why don't the immense airplanes fly around with their children? Which yellow bird fills its nest with lemons? Why don't they train helicopters to suck honey from the sunlight? Where did the full moon leave its sack of flour tonight? Excellent. Thank you, Roots. So I'll give you a moment now to just kind of absorb it. I'll read it for everyone one more time as well. En español, el libro de las preguntas. Número uno. ¿Por qué los inmensos aviones no se pasean con sus hijos? ¿Cuál es el pájaro amarillo que llena el nido de limones? ¿Por qué no enseñan a sacar miel del sol a los helicópteros? ¿Dónde dejó la luna llena su saco nocturno de harina? The Book of Questions by Pablo Neruda, number one. Why don't the immense airplanes fly around with their children? Which yellow bird fills its nest with lemons? Why don't they train helicopters to suck honey from the sunlight? 
Where did the full moon leave its sack of flour tonight? So, any first questions that you might have as a reader? Any first thoughts? And again, keep in mind, there's no right or wrong, you know, question to ask. If you need clarification, that's always a positive thing to ask, actually. And these are some of the skills that you may actually end up using when reading the work of another person that would be part of your cohort. So we're actually practicing uh, for the next couple of weeks. Yes, Julie? Um, I finally got it at the very last stanza where did the full moon leave its sack of flour tonight it's like he i think um he was being inspired by the moon's color you know and calling the sack of flour tonight mm -hmm. and each each stanza kind of does reflect that that notion even though he's using words that are you know not a hundred percent compatible with the line or the stanza. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's cool. I, yeah, it's a really good technique. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for noting that Julie. I think you're, you're uh, definitely onto something about the use of color without implying a color, right? Flower, the moon, you know, it's kind of implies the idea of a white moon, right? The full moon is white. Um, most of the time, uh, you know, the yellow bird and its lemons, you know, it's invoking a color with, you know, obviously yellow being in there, but, um, but the vividness of the color, I think comes through. So yeah, you're onto something for sure. Uh, Nettie wrote in the chat, the questions have an, uh, the naivete of a kid. I like them. Yeah. Thank you, Nettie. I appreciate the fact that you said, I like it with something that adds to that. It gives me a reason why you like it. Remember, when we're critiquing poetry, especially the poetry of another person who we are actually interacting with, it's really important to say why you like something. You can always like it. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. But it's very important to qualify it. Why do you like it? In Nettie's case, he likes the naivete of the questions. There is a sort of innocence to the way the questions are being posed. That always helps for the author to feel like their work is being actually listened to. Hay alguna otra observación por ahí? Any other thoughts? Any lingering questions that you might have? If we had Pablo Neruda here. Abraham? Well, first of all, I like um, how these couplets, like two two lines, they they have like this game of back and forth, right? It tells you or something, and then with the next line, it kind of gives you something that wouldn't fit with it and created this awkward contrast between them. And that kind of creates kind of this interesting poem on like you're still wondering exactly where is it going but it still makes sense it's just fun how he plays with these two different things in each stanza basically yeah yeah i appreciate that you're calling out the the contrasts of ideas there right that's a good thing for like if pablo neruda were with us he might uh, take that comment and say oh yeah, you're right. I'm creating contrasts of things that maybe don't fit, but I'm glad that it's working for you. So I'll I'll continue to explore that. So thank you for that observation, Abraham. Uh, San Juanita, I see you have your hand raised. Kind of like uh, Abraham, you know, and yeah. you know when you when I told you that I would read it, and I'm like, is that it? Like, because I had read it already, and I'm it kind of made me. It kind of made me feel like there was more to this, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, since I've done acrostic poetry, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, you base it on a, on a 
or at least we based it on an artwork. It mm -hmm. made me want to see the artwork, you know? Mm -hmm. What is what is this in reference to? Because mm -hmm. honestly, you know, the way it's written, it's and then it has a Roman numeral one. It's like I, I'm I'm used to seeing Roman numeral one and then number two, and then you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it kind of made me feel like there's more to it than this. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> since I didn't see more, I'm trying to make sense of it, but I can't. <laughs> I can't make sense of what, um, yeah. maybe because I'm not a child anymore <laughs> and, and I'm trying to make sense of it as an adult, you know, I don't know. Mm. So, yeah, I, I feel like there's more to it than, than this. <clears throat> I, I think you're right. You know, if we were to look at this within context of other works that are part of the same book, then I think you would maybe get a stronger sense of what it's meant to do and again you know really think about how you would read this and respond to this if we had Pablo Neruda here now unfortunately because of time I wasn't able to add more but there are more um, and technically speaking this is this is one single poem from the collection uh, so this is one question or one poem um, from the entire book, El Libro de Preguntas. Uh, so there is a two or three, I think if I remember correctly, it goes up to 35. Um, so there are 35 of these little mini poems, um, which, you know, if you were to receive it as a book, you would maybe get it. But as the author is working on it, you know, that might not necessarily be something that you benefit from. So uh, it, I think it is very good when you start reading the work of others in the class to to kind of ask, well, what is the context of this? What did you write this in response to? Was this in response to a photo that you took? Is this a response to the photo that was presented in class? You know, that kind of thing. So keep that in mind for those of you who are, you know, relatively new to giving other authors um feedback on their on their writing does anyone have any other comments or uh questions up to this point uh i got one yes elena um uh, i think your writing is good but uh, it needs more feedback on your writing so i'm not sure what uh what you meant for the writing okay well, that's a very good question to ask, Elena. Thank you for asking that. You know, yeah. and that is, again, you know, as you give other people feedback on their writing, you can always ask for, for more context. In this particular yeah. case, Elena, to answer your question or to maybe respond to your comment, you know, this is a, the work of uh, another writer named Pablo Neruda. And we're using this as an example of how we might give feedback on another person's writing. Yeah. yeah. Eric in the <laughs> chat wrote, it gives life to the subjects in each stanza, treating each one very artistically. Airplanes have kids, helicopters like bees, the moon as a person. Yeah. It's a very good observation there, Eric. So what Eric has done for us, if we were to be giving Pablo Neruda feedback on this, is Eric is calling out something that that Eric observes within the piece, you know, saying, oh, there's a th sort of theme that I'm hearing or a theme that I'm seeing. As you read work for the very first time, it's very useful to take the moment, um, to take the time that you need in order to, to kind of analyze it and pick up on, on the little things that, that, you know, are either supposed to be there or maybe they're not supposed to be there and then you can ask the questions as to whether or not they were supposed to be a part of this poem um and i agree with Majde. they all are highly imaginary questions so i'm going to give you an opportunity to do this one more time and this time you do have the benefit of this as context so understand this, per, this first poem that we're looking at is the context for the next one. The next one is one of my poems. And this one is called also the Book of Answers, or actually not also. This is called, or going to be part of my 
uh, one of my upcoming books, The Book of Answers, which is being written directly in response to Pablo Neruda's The Book of Questions. So, aquí les presento uno de mis propios poemas, El Libro de Respuestas Número Uno. So, this is the first one. This is directly in response to the first set of questions by Pablo Neruda. Um, it is a little bit longer. I can't fit it all entirely on the screen. Uh, maybe if we go like that and, uh, you know, drop the uh, the Roman numeral one. But do I have a volunteer that might want to read it out loud for us? Uh, I can read it. Yeah. All right. I'll let you give it a try, Elena. So you'll read the English one for me, okay? Yeah. This one that's highlighted. Yeah. It says that plains and honey gather among solar rays, the moon dripping of the booming color of a stunned helicopter, graced around its edges by wraps and bee wings, lemon pollinators let the children of the bird fly in my interior. And I will narrate for you. How the flight is the, is only for reaching the vocal wavelengths of a minor god. Excellent. Thank you, Elena. I appreciate You're you welcome. reading that for us. Thanks. Y en español, tengo por ahí un voluntario que me lo puede leer. Anyone want to give it a shot in Spanish? Uh, Ruth? So you raised your hand. Ruth? Deja amasar aviones y miel entre rayos del sol. Luna goteando. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Okay. Deja amasar aviones y miel entre rayos del sol, luna goteando con estruendo color a helicóptero pasmado y aleteado por su alrededor de avispas y abejas, polinizadores de limón. Deja que los hijos del pájaro vuelen por mi interior y yo te na narraré mm -hmm. con, como el vuelo es solo para alcanzar la onda de la voz de un dios menor. Excellent. Thank you, Roots. And I see in the chat we have a question from Erica. Erica writes, I have a question. For example, let's say I would uh, write a book inspired by the great Gatsby. How do you deal with the reference to the book? Do you have to ask permission of the author's family? That's a good question to ask, Erica. Um, I think it depends a lot on how you are, uh, referencing the great Gatsby. Um, it, if there are direct references or references that are uh, very obviously referencing the Great Gatsby, like let's say it's part of the world of Great Gatsby and it would be like a sequel, then that would probably require that you contact the author's family or the author's estate and have the license to be able to um, use characters that were created originally um, by uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. <clears throat> now, if you are writing a book that is inspired by The Great Gatsby, but has nothing to do with The Great Gatsby directly, then it would be more of a uh, kind of like a, you would just say something within your text uh, at the beginning and like a prologue, you know, this is inspired by, um, but it in no way is a part of uh, that. Um, and like in my case, this is, this is all work that is uh, 
in response to Pablo Neruda's poetry, but I'm not going to be publishing it with Pablo Neruda's poetry next to mine. Um, in my prologue, I would be writing something that acknowledges that this is all work that is being produced as a ecrastic type of work um, inspired by the work of Pablo Neruda. Therefore, you know, there's no direct copying. It's just kind of like remixing, if that makes sense. There's certain uh, legalities that are being avoided in that way. There's also the possibility of things like The Great Gatsby being, I believe, already in the Creative Commons. I believe. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but, you know, stuff like that is also going to play into uh, older works of art like that. Yeah, if it's in public domain. Yeah. Um, Julie, you have a question? Sorry. My other writing class, um, we, we always are um, using other authors to inspire us to write. Mm -hmm. That way we are able to write different styles. Um, we don't steal from the other writers, mm -hmm. but we are inspired by them. And um, that is really good to do. It's really fun to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and you really don't have to worry about it at all. I mean, unless you, you know, uh, take excerpts directly from whatever you're writing about. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly where the legality part of it kind of gets a little tricky if you're taking direct excerpts or if you're directly quoting. Um, and if it's also going to be used for commercial use, you know, so if you're making money off of it. You know, that's also going to add on that added layer of, you know, needing licensing and permission. Um, but if it's but there are certain things that uh, don't require licensing, like if it's for analytical use or educational use, you don't have to, you know, reach out to the author's estate or anything like that. Um, but in the case of work that is inspired by another work of art, you know, that's where kind of the ekphrastic idea comes from. You know, so my book of answers is essentially at its core an ekphrastic work of art. It's inspired by another work of art. I am creating something that is both acknowledging its origin, but at the same time, completely new, right? It's not like I'm, you know, directly pulling lines from Pablo Neruda's writing and saying they're mine. I'm actually kind of twisting it around and breaking it and reforming it into something new as, as best as I can. Uh, so I hope that kind of answers that, that part of the question, especially because we are going to be doing a lot of this um, for this particular series. Uh, San Juanita, you have a question or a comment? So, so yeah, so this is, for example, you know, literature books, mm -hmm. but I remember, remember I told you I did a crastic poetry mm -hmm. based on artwork, you know, pictures and paintings and stuff like that. Yeah. So let's say, uh, I don't remember who it was. I wrote, I wrote several pieces of, of, well, several poems based on artwork. What, how would I deal with the artwork? I mean, I'm not, if I am going to, let's say I want to publish the poems, I cannot use the artwork, right? Or how would I do it in this case? I mean, I cannot use the 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 picture a picture of the artwork, right? Right. But I suppose I can at least write inspired by you know whatever. Is that all I would write? Yeah, that's essentially all you have to write is you know acknowledging that this was inspired by another person's work of art. Um, yeah. And that again is essentially what ekphrastic poetry is, right? If ekphrastic poetry is not directly ripping off poetry from another person. It is new work that is inspired by another work of art. Um, and again, you know, just to go back to our, our uh, definition here, right? We have directly the, the definition according to the Poetry Foundation. Um, you know, we have the concept being laid out here. So this is really important for us to kind of 
keep in mind as we proceed over the next several weeks because you know we are we are going to be creating and we're going to be giving you exercises that ask you to create new works of art to then be inspired to write or create another work of art so this sort of constant remixing that we're going to be doing you know it's really important that we we get it right that we understand that we are not ripping off the work of another person and we're definitely not going to be using any kind of artificial intelligence here you know we're, we're going to be creating all brand new works of art that do take inspiration from another person's work of art but they're going to be completely our own and you're not going to be plagiarizing if you do at any point have any questions about how to cite like some of the questions that are coming up then you can always reach out to us and you can ask, well, you know, I want to include this particular piece or I want to include this line that I'm, you know, borrowing from another author. You know, how can I do that? And that is something that we can discuss, um, especially when we're when we're workshopping a piece. Um, and I appreciate, you know, that I, I'm getting uh, a couple of uh, uh, comments in the in the chat here, like, you know, Nettie's asking well, how do I know if a break fits or not in terms of a line break? You know, that's that's a really good question to ask of the author, you know, when they present a work of, of writing to you in your cohorts, when we start breaking out in cohorts. You know, why did you decide to break the line there and maybe not at this particular word? In my particular case, if I were to answer that question, I would say that um, it's just part of my technique. It's part of my personal style. I like to break my lines so that they're essentially like mini poems. Um, the best way that I can describe it is I look at a line of poetry in my poems and I say, okay, this juxtaposition of words creates its own micro image, right? Its own micro poem within the larger poem, rays, the moon dripping. You know, if I read just that, if it sounds poetic in a way that appeals to me, if it sounds like, you know, it's creating a, a very specific image, un helicóptero pasmado, you know, a shocked or a stunned helicopter. Um, that's a very unique image. And having it stand on its own on one single line, that for me is my style of poetry. It's something that you're welcome to incorporate if you think of your own poetry in that way. Um, but that's just my own technique. And I think that you know, if there were space to improve it, I would like to hear that, right? If you think that there's a better line break as a writer, I want to know because I want to improve my poetry. As long as I've been writing, you know, I by no means claim to be an expert. You know, I might have been teaching this for a long time, but again, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I don't have all the answers. Um, in fact, I might have more questions than answers sometimes. Um, in certain cases. So, you know, if you do have things that you'd like to call out in the poem, please feel free to to do so. You know, this this isn't um, like, like I said, uh, uh, an off, uh, like a taboo thing to do, even on my poetry. Um, Roots added in the chat, uh, quote, Steal Like an Artist is a great book talking about this, being inspired by many artists and taking their works and using their, using it for inspiration to create your own work, but not their exact work. Yeah, that's a pretty, pretty well-known uh, book for artists. <clears throat> um, Abraham says down with AI. Eric <laughs> added, it's like some making something new, the original sandwich that became the PB&J or the club sandwich or the meatball sandwich, the patty melt, the hamburger. Yeah. It's like putting your own twist on a classic, right? Um, that's another good way of thinking about this. You know, you are all cooks in the in the kitchen of poetry. So, um, you know, this is your opportunity now to take all of the same ingredients, but now it's your turn to add the sazon that works for you. Uh, what's your question, San Juanita? Okay. I'm going to ask because... I'm a little bit, I don't know, it's just like oh, bothering me, really bothering me. And if I don't, if I don't ask you, who am I going to ask? <laughs> so uh, I've written, I have written about 
You know when Fidel Castro supposedly died? Mm -hmm. Right. I wrote about Fidel. I wrote about Fidel, and of course I mentioned, I mean, it's very clear that it's about Fidel. I wrote something about when, uh, este, ¿cómo se llama? Juan Gabriel, cuando Juan Gabriel, Juan Gabriel murió. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I don't know if you know Alf Alfonsina Storni. Can we write about these people? Can, like, oh my gosh, I don't know. Can we write about like writers? In our, like, can I mention, for example, puedo escribir un poema que tenga tu nombre? Yeah. Como mi profesor, yeah. Luis Pichardo. You know, if I mention you, mm -hmm. there's no implication there, right? I can mention you in my poetry and then publish. Can I do that? Yeah, I mean, in my particular not... case, you you have my permission to do so. <laughs> um, you know, if it's in a flattering light, sure, even better. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> I think <laughs> if I were to understand your question, though, kind of deeper, if I'm hearing you right, you're you're asking essentially if you can reference people, living or past people, right? Can I reference or can I write about them? Yeah. Yeah. Can I write about them? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah. I I'm mean, not I'm not I'm not writing their work. I'm not doing I'm not copying their work or anything, mm -hmm. but I am writing about them. Like for example, lo de ese señor mm -hmm. Fidel, it wasn't anything nice, you know. Mm -hmm. And but, I can still I can still use that. Yeah. And, I mean it, it, it's think of it as like all of us are characters in your personal story. Right. Mm -hmm. So everyone that is that has existed and could exist, you know, is somebody that you can technically write about. OK. Um, now, whether you're presenting it in a way that is meant to be factual versus, you know, something that is creative, um, you know, there's I, I would say, you know, there are certain things that you would want to avoid um, so that you don't defame someone. You know, you don't want to speak. Uh speak uh false things about people and have that potentially be taken as fact um when it was meant to be fiction as long as there's like maybe a little disclaimer at some point where it says you know this is a work of art you know it's a work of fiction and this is not meant to be taken as a biographical thing um you know that could maybe just protect you legally but yeah um but ultimately the answer is yes you especially in the u.s you know have your first yeah. amendment right to essentially say what is your opinion about a particular individual. Yeah, because it is an opinion, you're right. Yeah. It's an opinion only. Yeah. So again, you know, you don't want to, you know, present it as if it was factual, you know. Okay. That's, keep in mind. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Angie, I saw that you had your hand up. Anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I just wanted to like add on to that. Um, if you guys like ever have a like get anything published about anybody, um, there are laws to add on to that, like defamation of character. That's mm -hmm. one thing you guys would want to keep in mind that if you guys do publish anything, most likely it's like even if it's like without their consent or anything, you guys like it, you would be liable. I mean, they would be they would be able to like take it into like they can basically sue you if they don't like what you write. So that's just that's just one thing you guys would always want to take in consideration. Um, but it's it's always when it comes to stuff like that, like it's it's always best to like somehow get consent. Um, but if they're like somebody who passed away or somebody who, you know, um, what is it called? Um, who's like, well, yeah, whoever passed away, like, and who's like no longer alive, and if they're like somebody who's famous and all that stuff, then it, it's like a risk because you know their families or whoever has the right to the royalties at that point or where whoever's like inheriting all of their like like the royals royalties at that point um they can come back and see that oh, this person's writing bad about whoever charged we're gonna frame them unless they like pay us a portion i don't know that's just you know for, 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 for thought just for me as <laughs> Yeah, like I said, you know, when it comes to the legalities of it, as long as you're not presenting something as as fact, then uh, then you're probably OK. You know, opinion is protected under under the law, but uh, things that are directly defamatory, that is not so. But good question, and I appreciate that.
And I also want to say thank you to Roots for just kind of bringing it back. You know, Roots wrote, I like that way of thinking about critiquing. Most of us feel a little ugh when our work is on the spotlight, even doubting ourselves. But to think instead, if there's a more effective way to write my poem, I would like to know about it. Um, and that is ultimately where I, I really want us to just remember that that is the purpose of the critiquing element of our workshop. So beginning next week, we will have our first creative writing lesson where we're going to teach a technique. Um, it'll be either a technique in poetry or in photography. And we will be asking you or inviting you to write something um, and create something that is inspired by the work that we present. And when that happens, you know, the Friday after we will be uh, expecting people to begin sharing the work with other people in their cohort. Again, you will receive your cohort assignments after this week, after this session, um, either tomorrow or Thursday. You will receive an email with the email addresses of the other people who are part of your cohort. Those will be the individuals with whom you will be sharing your work. And those should be the people who will, who um, are giving you feedback uh, in return for feedback on their work. So uh, that's part of the, the you know, agreements of being in, in the workshops. And, you know, this is all really designed for that, ultimately, for you to continue growing as writers, as authors, as artists. You know, we are always hoping to improve upon ourselves. By being in this class, we are hoping to improve on our writing by, you know, sharing our writing, because in the end, that is that is the purpose for, for asking for critique. So if you want to get more experience in critiquing, you know, you have this handout here. I definitely invite you to analyze the poetry that's being presented. And, you know, you can send me notes. I, I do not take offense to it. In fact, I am in really directly inviting you to do so. Um, and if it helps you sort of strengthen those muscles of giving critique, you know, all the better. For those who are maybe not as familiar with giving critique to visual art, since there will be uh, some, you know, photography exercises that will be part of this particular series, we are going to also look at a couple of uh, works of visual art. So let's uh, take a look here in a moment. Where is Photoshop? There it is. All right. So here we have a photograph by Lourdes Grobet. Lourdes Grobet, for those who are not familiar, is a Mexican-born photographer, um, most recognized or most known for her work uh, photographing, taking portraits of luchadores from uh, Mexican Lucha Libre. And this in particular is uh, Fray Tormenta. That's the name of the luchador that is being depicted here in this particular photo. He is actually giving mass within a, uh, a church. <laughs> yes, not Nacho Libre, but definitely uh, some of the inspiration for it. So for those who are looking to learn some skills in photography, you know, we will be covering different skills. But one of the things that I want to um, begin at least introducing now for you as we continue on in, in the series is we can do both uh, black and white and color photography, um, you know, as, as part of these exercises. So that's that's number one. And number two, when you're looking at the work that we're going to be presenting, you know, we're asking you not only to... Um, just admire it, but we're also asking you to critique it and look at the things that are working for a particular photograph. One of the things that you might notice in this particular photograph is the positioning of, of the character, we'll call him, right? Fray Tormenta in the photograph. Let me see if I can zoom in on this just a little bit, just to make it a little bit easier to see. So this is the photograph itself, right? It's a square photograph. And if you look at the positioning of Fray Tormenta in the frame, he's in the lower third of the frame. And we have one arm raised holding the ostia. 
um, the the Eucharist. And ultimately, it's forming what's called a leading line, right? If you look at where his eyes are looking, his arm is going, you know, it's it's going up to what is in his hand. In visual art, that is going to be one of the techniques that you will see a lot is the use of leading lines and the use of essentially shapes. You know, we have like a triangle shape that is happening here with this character. But not only that, you know, you're looking at also possibly as a secondary character, this um, statue of what looks to be Christ, right, in the background, also holding his hand up. So you have this repetition that, that you might be getting, uh, picking up on as you study the, the photograph. These are simple techniques that you can start using when critiquing some of the photography that might be presented uh, as part of this series. Um, and then, you know, you can also look at things like color. You know, the color is fairly vibrant. Um, I did add a couple of, uh, you know, modifications to the, to the scan because this was not the best scan. Um, when I scanned it out of the book that, that this came from. Um, but, you know, we have uh, the repetition of the color red, you know, that it is coming across as relatively vibrant. You know, there's also the gold. Um, so there's other things that, you know, visually might stand out to you. And if you were to critique this, you know, give it, give it some points, um, you know, you could say, well, uh, you know, the color saturation is maybe a little strong. I feel like, you know, the red is kind of overpowering. Um, you know, and that's something that a person could potentially fix afterwards using uh, software, either that on their phone or on an iPad or other form of tablet. You know, there are apps that uh, we'll, we'll be probably introducing as we go that, that could help you um, with some minor edits of your, of your photography. Now, this next one is by another Mexican photographer by the name of Graciela Iturbide. And this is a black and white photograph that was taken also from a book. The scan was taken from a book. Uh, the name of the photograph itself is Señor de las Aves, Nayarit, Mexico, 1985. And Graciela Iturbide, uh, you know, again, very well-known photographer, uh, did a lot of work in black and white. So the majority of their work you will see in black and white. And again, if we look at this one, we're going to start looking for things like leading lines. Look at the shapes and the way that the shapes are guiding your eyes. When it comes to visual art, that is one of the things that you want to try to, to just, again, hone in on. Where are your eyes going? What is the first thing that stands out to you? In my particular case, I would say, you know, it's the it's the man, right? It's the most recognizable thing for us. We are naturally drawn to human forms. So naturally, my eye wants to go to the man looking up. But not only that, look at the birds, right? Their wings are open. There's a particular angu angularity to it. Um, the photograph is in some ways mimicking even the color on the man's jacket and his shirt, right? The wings themselves are kind of open and wide where the collar is open and wide. Um, they do kind of look like bats. I agree with you, Erica. Um, you know, we luckily know, right, that these are birds because of the name. So we are given some context by the title. And that is another thing to consider. Titles are very, very important when we're looking at not just photographs and visual art, but also poetry, because a title can give a lot of context. You know, we we can definitely learn a lot about a particular piece by just simply reading the title. Um, and yeah, you know, the black and white starkness, right? The, the sky itself is white and everything else is in shadow for the most part. Um, you know, it's definitely an interesting uh, shot. Uh, I like Mojde, you know, that his hair is like the feathers of the birds. Yeah, I agree with that, too. Uh, Miss Michelle wrote, everything old is new again. That 39-year-old vintage photo shows character and freedom. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I'm glad that you picked up on the on the collar and the and the wings mimicking them each other. 
<laughs> and yeah, see, it, it reminded Miss Michelle of the movie The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. So if you were to take this photo, right, and you were to look at it, absorb it, you know, what is the story that is that is being told here? You know, that's something that you now get to sort of make up for yourself. And that could potentially be uh, what inspires your poem in response to this, right? So storytelling is always going to be at the core of what we do as artists, whether it's through visual storytelling or, uh, you know, literal storytelling in the form of writing and verbal storytelling. We're always telling some kind of story. So that could be a challenge for you uh as as you move forward you know and taking inspiration from other people's work what is the story that is being told here um yeah i agree it looks like ink stains on the blank paper it's cool um his thoughts pace so fast he can't verbalize it's just birds flying in all directions nice see Nettie's already inspired to write <laughs> thank you Nettie. Um, does anyone have any questions so far or anything else they, you know, would like to add to the idea of critiquing visual art? I would even venture to say we might have a specialist in this, in the house. I won't call you out, but if you'd like to share, you're more than welcome to. What? <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> I was about to say, if you don't call him out, I'll call him out. Abraham? Ouch. <laughs> what, what was the question again? <laughs> well, just anything you want to add. Um, but oh. you weren't actually the person I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wasn't thinking about him either. <laughs> um, but I did see a hand raised from Julie. So, yeah, I... I do write about art. Yeah. And, you know, what I do when I write about art is I try and into it what the artist uh, is trying to say. Um, but then when I'm writing, um, and that's if I'm, you know, like writing an article about that artist and their work. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm writing and the work is just, I'm just being inspired by it. Um, I'll interpret it whatever way I want, and I'll like make it my own in a in a completely unique way um, that hopefully will capture the essence of what the the work of art is about. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm always looking for that essence. Excellent. Well, I like that. I like that idea, right? We are always looking for the essence, and um, maybe the maybe that sort of piggybacks a little bit on the idea of what I was saying, where you know everything is about storytelling, you know, and what are the stories that we are capturing, whether that be through visual art or through poetry. And you know, when I was younger, I used to think of poetry in that way, right? Poetry has the capacity of being a moment in time, a verbal moment in time the way that a photograph can be a moment in time um so that could also potentially help inspire your approach to to some of the uh the exercises that we'll be providing you with um miss michelle added the bare winter tree reminds me of veins and mojda asks the photo is a combination of photo and painting um no actually this is purely a photo um I could take away the text there and, you know, you can see it without the interruption of the text. But um, but yeah, this is a photograph, a complete photograph, the same way that the other one was a photograph straight out of the camera. Um, of course, I added the text because I wanted to make sure that we gave credit, you know. Um, so to critique, I want to actually give you all a an opportunity to critique one of my photographs. Um, this is actually a photograph that I took. I don't even remember. I think it was 2011. Um, I've sold a few prints of this one. So, you know, there's definitely uh, an audience for it. 
Uh, I call it the writer. And what are your thoughts? What do you see? What are some critiques you might have for me? Uh, Angie, you also have a hand raised? It looks upside down. <laughs> yes, that is on purpose. Nice. Can I ask why uh, why you decided to flip it that way? Because if I turn my computer around, let me do that real quick. Yeah, it looks pretty cool even on the opposite side. But like, why, why, like what made you decide to do that? Um, so when I first took the photograph, this is actually how I took it. Um, I happened to be walking and I had my camera turned upside down. Um, so the photograph was taken upside down and rather than flipping it, um, I decided to keep it in this orientation because I felt like it was a more interesting photograph this way, you know, the, the shadow, sort of interrupts our expectations of what a photograph is supposed to be, right? Uh -huh. uh, so for me, that's why I decided to flip it um, or not flip it in this particular case. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It looks like, part of me, it looks like when like the actual person who's riding the bike, it looks like he's about to float away into like space or something. Um, but your photo reminds me a lot, like the ending of a movie. Mm -hmm especially the way you put the writer loot on your name. Mm. I don't know. That just, this is my own. I like it. It looks pretty cool. I like the black and white, but I, I've always kind of been a fan of black and white photography. A, there's always an elegance in my opinion. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I, no. Luis, can, can I say something, Luis? Yeah, go ahead. I would be troubled if you were out of the bike lane. <laughs> <laughs> like he's in the bike lane on both sides. And I'm like, is he, is he? So yeah, that would trouble me if you were <laughs> out of the lane. I like that picture. I really do. And now yeah. I did notice, like I, I read it in the chat, that the shadow is actually the main character. Mm -hmm. it, well, at least that's what I see from here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Nice yeah. picture. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the shadow is i like that it's the shadow of julie's life <laughs> um and you know just just to be clear uh i added the the title again to provide context that's not actually part of the photograph so um if you were to buy it off of my website it wouldn't it would be like this without without the text um but yeah you know uh, definitely the first thing that that should pop out is the the shadow um, this one was taken, I think, with more of an accident. So for me, um, for my part, this is uh, more just, you know, a, a photograph that just happened. Um, and the way that I processed it is, you know, I directly converted it to black and white. This was taken in, in color. Um, and believe me, in color, it does not look all that great. Uh, it just looks like a, like a, incorrect photo um but what other things might you see here you know what are some of the secondary things that that, that draw your eyes to maybe the shadow or that your eyes are kind of going towards it looks vintage thank you the city on the right corner the white line yeah yeah. So again, you know, those are those are things that I was actually able to manipulate in um, the processing of the photo. I was able to create, you know, more contrast. Um, I was able to make the white line of the bike lane actually pop out a bit more. Uh, I purposely made this section of the photo a little bit darker, you know, where the uh, the sort of city life part is. Right. Um, and. So yeah, those were some of the things that I consciously and still now could adapt or modify if you as a as a person critiquing my photo said, you know what, it's sort of taking me out of the photo. Um, you know, that's maybe an area where you could improve the photo. Right. Um, Abraham. Yeah, it's one of the things about color photography, and it's tends to lose some of the contrast. Mm -hmm. So once you switch to uh, black and white, you get that a, a lot of a con 
trust back into the image. Mm -hmm. And that's why you also focus a lot into the white lines as well, that basically also create this angle that's going towards the right upper corner of the mm -hmm. photo. You have the sidewalk, this line going up, up the head of the shadow. Mm -hmm. And then you have these white lines. And then the ending of the street also points that way. So it gives the photo this sense of direction. Mm -hmm. Usually the, the main subject goes to that point. But in this case, because the subject is bigger, it grabs your attention first. And then those lines direct you to that side, like leaving the photo to that way. Yeah. Thank you, Abraham. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, and I appreciate the other comments too. <laughs> Astrid wrote, this photo makes me feel grateful for the sun. That's a strong shadow. It must have been a sunny day. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a sunny day. Um, believe it or not, this was taken in uh, December, though, of 2011. So uh, one of our classic sunny Decembers. <laughs> um, Erica writes, like the kid is dressed like in the 80s or 90s. Yeah, it's, you know, you don't get to see too much of the of the kid on the bike. Um, but yeah, I definitely get what you mean. You know, the, the style is there. Uh, Roots wrote, it makes me think of how it's more of our shadow selves living in the cities. Yeah, that's, that's, I really appreciate the metaphors. See, now you're starting to add some of the uh, story there. Um, and hopefully that will inspire you to write something from it. Um, Eric wrote, writing in the upside down, chasing something floating, maybe a little cloud. <laughs> I like that. Uh, the bike lane is not safe enough. Can this be a possible expression of bike lane activism? Yeah, I like that. If that's where it's taking you, that, that's those are really good pieces of feedback. Um, like for me as the artist, if I wanted to maybe offer this as a photo for a uh, bike lane activism kind of movement, yeah, that that's good for me to know. It made you think that. Um, it seems the rider holding the white line like a rail on the road. Yeah, I like that. Thank you, Mojde. Fine, but pay taxes too. Yeah, exactly. Um, to and, add, uh, when those when those bicyclists were in front of me, uh -huh. and I was driving to work or to to school, oh my goodness! I mean, I'm fine, but they don't even pay taxes. My son, my son, and I always argued about that. Mm -hmm. Mom, mom, they have a right. I'm like, yes. Do they pay taxes? And he's like, no. <laughs> so that's all. That's all. I just had to add that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways. Well, I mean, everybody pays taxes if you're paying for, if you're buying stuff, right? Sales. No, tax. no. What I'm saying, what I'm saying, I pay the tax, you know, like for my car mm -hmm. to be circulating, right? Yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. That kind of tax. <laughs> yeah, I pay taxes too. I pay property taxes. I pay mm -hmm. sales tax. I pay all these kinds of taxes. But, you know, and, and that was one of the things that I would always tell my son, yeah. you know, he, he was not driving, let I me mean, riding a bike, but uh, yeah, yeah, fine. Be on the road and, but, and then follow, follow the rules like everybody else, you know? Yeah. And we're always at fault. The drivers are at fault while the bike, people on the bikes, you know, they're never at fault. You know, even if they do something that they're not supposed to. Yeah. Anyway, that's, a, that's a story for another day. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank well, you yeah. for the I mean, more, moral of that story is definitely be safe when you're riding a bike and you know in everyone's case just drive responsibly <laughs> um abraham i saw that you had your hand raised too did you have something else to add before we do the last one no i think it was left from the last one. Oh, okay yeah. all right so i do have this last one here uh also one of my photos also I have sold prints of this one. This one is called Ventanas. And I'll go ahead and take the title off of it. Um, and so another thing to, to sort of consider as you're looking at photography is, um, you know, repetitions, right? Repetitions, patterns, those are always simple things that you can look for when critiquing um, <clears throat> not just photography, but also poetry. Um, if you find yourself reading a piece that repeats a word or repeats a phrase, clearly that's meant to grab your attention. Um, and, you know, I, I personally like the the sort of the rule of thirds idea, you know, whether that be in photography, visual art, uh, or even in poetry. 
twice is kind of coincidence. Three times is definitely a pattern. And so if you're going to be doing repetitions in writing, you know, do it three or more times in photography and in uh, other forms of visual art, kind of the same idea. You know, if you're trying to emphasize something, uh, consider how patterns and repetitions can uh, just help you tell that story. So in this particular case, it's maybe a little bit more of an abstract work. But, you know, if you were to look at this, what are some of the things that you would say? What would you tell the photographer, in this case, me, you know, as as uh, points of critique? You know, what are things that could maybe be improved uh, on this particular photo if you feel there are things to improve? And uh, Miss Michelle says, I see cold, hard concrete. It's an interesting observation. Um, uh, see a little conversation on bicyclists. Uh, Julie writes, there is power in this photograph, the looming hard walls of the building, the height going up, up, up invokes the power. Yeah. So perspective, right? That perspective shift tells a, tells a message or implies a message. Most to write, I, it, it's like. A black poem and the white background are like spaces creating stanzas. Yeah, I like that. Um, the angle of the photo by the windows being flat, I can see someone walking on the white path, writes Miss Michelle. Nettie wrote, that's a tilt angle. How did I handle the camera and not shake? Uh, well, you know, from a technique standpoint, uh, yeah, it was just handheld. I didn't. It's a sunny day, too, so that's luckily what cast the shadows that you see. Um, this was taken the same day as the photo for the uh, bicyclist. And um, it was just sunny enough where I didn't I didn't have to use a slower shutter speed. Uh, but I did purposely position myself as the photographer uh, in a position where I was center and I was able to capture this repetition of patterns. So in this particular case, as a photographer, I was very purposely creating the image in my mind um, and through my position. So I was putting myself in the place that I needed to be in order to capture this image. Uh, and San Juanita wrote, imagine how each window holds people from all walks of life, different ideas, personalities, goals, etc. Yeah like that you're already starting to draw inspiration for your own stories so does anyone have any questions or any maybe doubts about how to give feedback whether that be on photography visual art or poetry in color this could be beautiful too yeah, if the building was in color, then yeah, it would have been a fairly striking image. But actually, the building itself was painted white, and the uh, windowsills were practically gray. So yeah. um, it looks like different sized flat TVs on the building. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could see that, Eric. Yeah. Uh, Nettie asks, how not to feel shy when you go on your way taking pictures outdoors? Um, and yeah, certain city regulations could be why the windows are all the same. Um, or just for the sake of how expensive buildings can be. Uh, that might be why they're the same. But to answer Nettie's question about how to avoid shyness, well, um. I mean, it sort of comes down to practice uh, in some cases. Like this, this is a, a photo of an inanimate object, right? Uh, the owner of the building couldn't really tell me anything because there's no real distinguishing uh, elements of the building. So, you know, I'm able to take a photo of it and you probably would never be able to figure out where this is. Um if you're taking photos of iconic locations, then, you know, some some of those locations might require a uh, license agreement to be able to use that photo. Um, 
and uh you know so there are certain things when it comes to taking photos that you want to take take into consideration um i did take this with a dslr so something that is more like a professional camera but uh, i've taken similar photos like this with my iphone um, you do not have to have professional equipment to capture photos like these you can use tablets you can use phones um, you can if you have a compact point and shoot camera you can do that as well uh, ultimately when it comes to photography it's just a matter of kind of taking the photo without thinking about it <laughs> um, you know that that could help you avoid shyness if you don't want to take photos of people you don't want to do street portraits then you know you just kind of um, sort of from a distance take photos you can always uh, kind of avoid the face and take photos of like shoulders you know uh, reflections you can always shoot through glass there's a lot of different techniques that you can use to still take street photos um, but not have to have people identifiable people in the photos um, and to answer San Juanita's question about homework tonight uh, is really more just an introductory lesson. Like I said before, this isn't really meant to um, give you any kind of homework assignment, but this is all stuff for you to think about as you prepare for the remaining classes. Uh, tonight's session, again, is just sort of giving you some of the basic tools that we're going to be introducing and uh, using throughout the entire series for people who are who are not new to the program. For those of you who are returning to the program, uh, you know, we're happy to have you back. And, you know, it's going to be a lot of the same. You'll, you'll at least kind of get to work on the same skills that we've been working on. And, you know, hopefully learn some new ones as we go. Uh, but for the most part, you know, this is tonight's session is, again, you know, for uh, those of you who are maybe new to photography specifically and don't really know how to approach it. Uh, so I hope that this was enough of a primer. Um, and again, we will be going over more techniques as weeks go on. So you won't be kind of expected to know everything right off the bat. Um, let's see. Do you need the people you shoot to sign something or is their oral consent enough? Uh, in most cases, uh, an oral consent is fine if you are going to be publishing something and uh, benefiting from it in, in a monetary way, you should just, to protect yourself and to protect the person, uh, get a actual modeling contract or something, something that allows you to use their likeness. Um, and uh, I think that more or less answers that question. If you are in the street, you can take photos of anyone without getting their permission. Yeah, generally speaking, that is correct. Um, Julie is right. You can take a photo of anybody out on the street. It's technically documentary. Um, it's different when it starts to be used in commercial uh, commercial ways. But, you know, if you're taking photos of, of uh, people and they're cool with it and they have consented, orally consented, then you know they they technically are giving up their their uh, right to to say you can't make money off of my my portrait. Um, but again, always just out of respect for people, don't make money off of their likeness without their permission. It's just the safest route to go. So. With that, I think I'll stop sharing. I'd like to open it again to questions, if anyone has any questions. And as a reminder, next week will be our first official lesson where we will be giving a homework uh, prompt for you to either write or create something new. And after uh, tonight's session, again, by the end of this week, you will be receiving an email from me with your cohort assignment. And that will be the group with whom you will be sharing your work. Does anyone have any final thoughts or final questions they'd like to ask before we sign off? Yes, Neri. Hi, Luis. I have a question. Yeah. When it comes to the cohorts, are, are they going to be 
only writing cohorts or only picture cohorts or is it all going to be mixed uh like just uh, like i have that question like uh, what are we exactly going to be critiquing in each individual cohort We, every week that we have a lesson, are going to give you a technique and a tool to use um, to inspire you to create something new. So you have the option of theoretically doing both, um, either a photograph and a poem or a poem only or a photograph only. Uh, so we're going to be flexible in that way as much as uh, the lesson allows. I'm not expecting everyone to do everything um, as part of the the like homework assignments uh, because they're technically open to interpretation. So you can expect to have a mix of people doing photography and poetry or just poetry or just photography. I think I think that answers the question. Um, but yeah, if again, you know, at some point you feel like you're not getting the type of feedback that you were expecting, you can always just drop me a message and I will, uh, you know, help sort out whatever, um, you know, questions you might have about your cohorts. Okay, thank you, Luis. That answers the question. I mean, also it goes the other way, right? What if I am not like, uh, even if it's with good intentions, I am not providing the feedback the other person needs or expects from me, so that that was that was why i was asking but thanks yeah i mean the the main thing to remember is that the point of tonight's session was to give you at least some of the tools now so that you know what to expect um and so that you can already start kind of thinking about you know your own work and how you would want to receive feedback um and again every week that we give a lesson we will try and Uh, reinforce the tools that we've covered and we'll give you an opportunity to practice before you give feedback. So, um, yeah. Julie? So I was thinking that we were going to do for photograph and then we would write a poem based on the photograph that we mm -hmm. took. Is that how it's going to work? Yeah, generally speaking, that is that is going to be how it works. Um, we might give you like a specific type of photograph um, that we might be thinking of, or we might give you a specific type of poem um, to attempt to write uh, in response to a photograph. So it's it's a little bit of both. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. All right. Well. If there are no more questions, then we will call it a night. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. For those of you who joined on the live streams, thank you for joining in. Uh, you can, of course, still enroll in Conchas y Café. Uh, just visit our website at distillarts.org slash Conchas y Café Zine. For those of you who are fully enrolled and receiving the handouts through Zoom, I'm sorry, through uh, Google Classroom, uh, this video recording will go up there along with the handouts again. Um, for you to be able to reference them later if you have questions later. And uh, feel free to reach out at any point if you have further questions that need clarifying. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you next Tuesday uh, with our very first full lesson of the series. So thank you, everyone. Hope you all have a good night. Take care. <laughs>